Welcome to Montgomery Talks, the podcast from Montgomery Community Media about the issues in the county. I'm MCM senior reporter Doug Tolman, and we're recording this in our podcast studio in MCM's offices in Rockville. With me today is Evan Glass, a freshman council member of the Montgomery County Council. He helped form the South Silver Spring Neighborhood Association, which fought for sidewalks and crosswalks so pedestrians can walk more safely to the Silver Spring Metro Stop. He also helped found Conservation Montgomery, which fought for more green space in downtown Silver Spring and stood up to Pepco's aggressive tree cutting program. Program. He has a lot more on his resume. I could go on for some time listing it all. But I will add one thing, however. Glass is a former journalist, having worked 12 years at CNN. Welcome, Mr. Glass. Hi, Doug. Thanks for having me. Okay. We're speaking a day after you introduced legislation to end the county's pay imbalance between uh, men and women. Could you first describe the legislation you introduced? Sure. So I introduced as my first piece of legislation on the Montgomery County Council what I'm calling the Montgomery County Pay Equity Act. And what it is intended to do is close the wage gap that exists between individuals of different genders here in Montgomery County. When I first was inaugurated and started hiring my my team uh, to work in my office, I realized that they were being asked for their pay stub to justify the salary that I was giving them. And it struck me as odd because when you rely on pay history to set new pay, uh, you're only perpetuating the wage gap that exists. And here in the state of Maryland, women make 79 cents to every dollar a man makes. And that number, those figures are worse for women of color. African-American women make 69 cents to the dollar and Latinas make 48 cents to the dollar. So those are real dollars and cents problems that we have. And so in my research, I found that there are uh, some real systemic inequities that exist currently within county government, and my bill is aimed at correcting that. So uh, at your press conference yesterday, you presented a lot of data to support the bill, but the data comes from women who currently work for the county. That is correct. This legislation really won't help them because this is all about new hires. Right. So doesn't that seem a little ironic? Well, so when whenever there is a problem, it needs to be addressed. And there's always a first step. And this is that first step. I have uh, reams of data that show that inequities exist all across the county. And we can you know, even go into some examples if, if we have time. But the reality is, if we're going to fix the problem, we have to address it. This is shining sunlight on this problem. And it will take effect 90 days after it is passed by the county council and signed by the executive all of whom support it, unanimous support among my colleagues. And so future employees of the county will hopefully be hired uh, at equitable wages. Uh, But it does force a tough conversation of how we do right by those who are currently employed. Okay. Uh, And since I brought up irony, I don't want anyone to think that I missed the irony of two white guys talking about uh, the the pay inequity with women that, and it affects greatly people of color. So I just, as a quick aside, but we often hear that statistic about women making less than men. You said 79 cents. I've heard 80 cents, but it's, it's in that ballpark for sure. Yep. But it's a national average, or you you had the Maryland average. Yeah, so so uh, unfortunately, the numbers aren't that different nationally and locally. The numbers I just shared were were Maryland data that show that the the wage gap that does exist. And you know, while we're talking about seventy nine cents or eighty cents, whatever it is, even one cent matters because it's the multiplier effect. If you've been in a job for five years, ten years, and you were constantly making less than your your colleagues, your male colleagues, over time that adds up and and the discrepancies that I've found in pay add up to down payment on a mortgage, a new car, college tuition for a child. That's real money. Right. But when you hear that average, maybe I'm, uh, maybe it's just just me, but uh, I think of it and think, well, it's, this can't be happening in Montgomery County, least of all in the county government. So why exactly you know, is it happening? I mean, what happened? Well, so the fact is here we are in 2019 in a progressive jurisdiction like Montgomery County, and we have pay inequity taking place right here in our own backyard. Who would have thought that that was happening? But it is, right. as you note. And so I found research that shows that in one instance, 
within the Department of Transportation, four individuals were hired during a certain time period. Three men and one woman. That one woman works there, has worked there twice as long as, as the three colleagues, yet she makes between eight and $28,000 less than each of them, or than all three. In another instance, within the Department of Health and Human Services, there were 13 individuals that were hired within a time period, 12 women and one man. That one man makes more than all of his colleagues, all manager level positions, and the range is between five and a half and approximately $30,000. And so while you can lay some blame at negotiating styles or other, other items possibly within their resume that make a difference, the simple fact is the data doesn't lie. There is something inherently wrong in our hiring process to create these discrepancies. Um, the unions support your legislation. They do. And yet you would have thought that they would be well aware of this discrepancy as it was happening, that when these people were hired, you know, why did you hire this person at a specific level and not at the same level as, uh, why did you hire this woman at a level and why didn't you hire her at the same level as the men she works with? So, you know, the, the, the way our, our unions work, they don't get into some of that individual data, the individual salaries that, in, that their members make. But, you know, the bottom line line here is that this information is only available, became available to me and to the public because of our open data processes here. Anyone can go to Data Montgomery and put in a name or search for certain jobs and see how much people make. And so while I think, uh, you know, uh, water, uh, water cooler fodder people have, you know, maybe looked up what their colleagues or their bosses make because it's all public, it hasn't been compiled in a way that can show the systemic problems that we have. That's the data that I've collected. Uh, removing it from any personal interest that one might have, but broadening it out to certain categories in certain areas. And, and I, you know, the, the, the truth is, I don't know if any of the 13 employees within the Department of Health and Human Services that I talked about, if they work together, if they know each other, but they all have the exact same pay grade. And so they are qualified for this same job, yet these discrepancies exist. So I'm shining some light, uh, digging through the data, and this is the problem that I found. Right. Well, Open Montgomery isn't just something that just appeared recently. It's something that's been up for years, and I believe the salary information has been up for four or five years. I, I, I think that's the time frame uh, for, for which this information has been available. But much like in, in many other aspects of life, we have lots of data, but we just don't have time to sift yeah. through it and find, find the compelling arguments. So let's say you take a deep dive into your workforce and you examine, say, an $80,000 a year male manager doing the same job as a $60,000 a year female manager. And you have to figure out how to right that wrong. It could be that the $80,000 a year male manager is making too much, and I'm sure he's not going to like seeing a 20% a cut in pay, if I did the math right. And meanwhile, taxpayers aren't going to be too excited about a $60,000 a year manager, male or female, getting a, a, th a third increase in their pay just to be equal to the men she works with. I mean, is that where this is heading? So I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not sure. I recognize that this is a problem, and we're talking about the problem that exists, and, and I believe it's universally under, uh, agreed upon and understood that it is a problem. Where we go from here is, is a tougher conversation, and so I have spoken with the county executive who supports the legislation, and he is currently on the hunt for a new director of human resources, and this is going to be my top priority with whomever fills that role, how to manage within our bureaucracy the 10,000 people who would be affected by this legislation and how we how we do right by everybody who's currently in our system. Okay. We we hear a lot about, you know, pink collar jobs versus blue collar jobs. Women typically go into teaching, men typically go into engineering or on a more county level, maybe it's they go into building maintenance or whatever. Is your research revealing that some of that is at play or is, is this isn't at all a question of, you know, a program manager in a more, pardon the term, female-dominated profession versus a, a manager in a male-dominated profession? So so it's a good question you ask because the data that, that I've shared and the data that we collected, it was refined. And so the only information that I'm sharing was for jobs 
job classifications where there were more than 15 hires during that time period, where there were men and women, so it wasn't a, a simply gender-oriented position. So, so it was adjusted for that. Mm -hmm. And and the data speak for itself. I, you know, we also found that there were a number of, of job categories where there was absolutely no difference. You know, there were firefighters and bus drivers and, and other careers here in the county where everyone gets the same starting salary. And that might be a different, that might be a way to move forward as well, maybe tightening the pay grades within some of these manager positions so that there is less discrepancy for the position that one is hired. And maybe that means we create more grades so that we can accommodate the different salaries within, but so that those that have that specific job show little to no pay inequity. Would more grades solve the problem, though? It would seem as though that's part of the problem, is that you've got a range at which somebody can be hired, and somebody, a man, is able to negotiate the higher salary, and a woman apparently is, is not able to negotiate and gets a lower salary. Well, so if you have a manager one position within a department and the range is 65 to say $90,000, those are the numbers that we're talking about and the range fluctuates within there. If we were to change that so that within, so that instead of having one grade with a $30,000 difference, we create two or three different grades within. So if you're being hired for a, a director one position, a manager one position, maybe there is a five to $10,000 differential. So the the ability to fluctuate is diminished. Is this the kind of thing that the council should encourage, I guess it'll be the new inspector general, to investigate annually every other year to make sure that this goal is main maintained? Or is this not something that would be under that person's purview? So it would not be under that person's purview, but in my legislation, it actually instructs the executive to do a report every two years, not only on how this is doing in the county and creating a more equitable workplace, but also doing a landscape analysis uh, within the private sector of the county, seeing what, what discrepancies might be existing there. Because there is a, a bill at the state level that would ban the use of pay stubs uh, for, for anybody, government and, and private employers. My bill doesn't do that because I think that we should lead by example and we should start at home because that's where I found the, the glaring examples. But we know that this is a real problem across the board and the legislation would instruct a, a broader landscape analysis. Okay. Your bio mentions that you were raised by a single mother. How did, how did that inform your, your taking up this issue? My parents divorced when I was about five, and I grew up in, in my home with my mother. It was just the two of us. And my mom worked two jobs to provide for me, and I saw how much she struggled. And she wasn't always treated fairly and sometimes had a hard time maintaining a job for a period of time. And it was a real struggle. And what I know is I've gotten into public life and trying to be a good citizen because of the values I learned from my mom that we need to help people. You know, we need to speak the truth. You know, those are the same reasons I, I went into journalism, recognizing that people need their voices amplified and they need to have a megaphone to speak to the powers that be. And that's what journalism can do. And the flip side of that is being an elected official where actually I'm now at the table listening to journalists and listening to members of the public. Uh, but, m but my mother struggled and she uh, lived a stressful life, which manifests itself by smoking nearly two packs of cigarettes a day. And that resulted in her dying of lung cancer at the age of 53. And so those are, those are the personal stories I carry with me. And when I meet single moms uh, um, or individuals who, who have um, family members of passive cancer, I, um, it weighs on me. Okay, I think now's a good time to take a break. This is Doug Tallman, senior reporter at MCM, speaking with council member Evan Glass. Um, we'll be right back. MCM, your community media center, is making Montgomery County a great place to live through programs like 21 This Week. Montgomery County's hardest hitting political talk show keeps you up to date with the local political scene. Montgomery Community Media, our middle name is Community.
And we're back at Montgomery Talks. This is Doug Tallman, senior reporter at Montgomery Community Media, and I'm with uh, Council Member Evan Glass, who, as one of his duties on the council, is to be the lead member on homelessness. That's right, Doug. So when was the last time a point-in-time study was done in Montgomery County, and what were, do you know the results? So we had a point-in-time study back in January, which I participated in. And for your listeners, I'll back up and, and say a point-in-time study is a night during the year when the community community goes out, walks around, and counts the number of individuals who are experiencing homelessness. So I participated in one in downtown Silver Spring, and it was me and about 40 other people. And there were other groups throughout other communities in the county. And we left the building, the Silver Spring Civic Building, a little after 10 o'clock, walked around till 2.30. And you know, I can say, quite frankly, it was a little boring. And the reason it was boring is we didn't find that many people who were experiencing homelessness in the alleys or in the streets, which is a good thing. We did we did find a number of people who were in the Silver Spring Transit Center, which, uh, as you could probably imagine, at 1, 1.30 in the morning is uh, a safe, enclosed environment, uh, not susceptible to the elements. And so we did s- see some people there, but by and large, it was a relatively quiet, quiet evening. The numbers are going to be compiled across the board, and we'll have a report out uh, in, in a few weeks' time. But homelessness in general here in Montgomery County is on the decline. We have reached effective zero homelessness for veterans, which essentially means on any given day we have between zero and maybe three or four people who are veterans who are experiencing homelessness. And the number for those experiencing chronic homelessness homelessness is on the decline. And we hope to reach effective uh, zero in, in probably two or three years, which is a testament to all the great work that our nonprofit community and, and former council members and government leaders, the resources they've put into this has been tremendous, and it's it's paying off in a good way. Okay. I believe uh, in uh, 2014 that the county created a 10-year plan to get to zero homelessness. It sounds like you're ahead of schedule. We are ahead of schedule. And you know, in the, the first three months of me serving on the council, I've been touring facilities all throughout the county and shelters and food banks to, to see what we're currently doing and the number of individuals that we're, we're providing services for. And then, quite frankly, asking how we can do even better and what, we, what members uh, of our nonprofit community, what kind of resources they need to better fulfill their mission. And there are there are some things I'm learning that we can, can do better, but we are well on our way. And as you noted, we are ahead of schedule, knock on wood, to, to reach uh, effective zero for chronic homelessness. Okay. If you if you do reach effective zero, would you still be the lead member of, or would the council even need a lead member for homelessness? I think we always need to remain vigilant, and we should always be looking out for those who are the most vulnerable members of our community. Putting the the question another way, I am the council's lead on homelessness and vulnerable communities because I am not a chair of one of our committees. And so the way the council provides leadership opportunities for those who are not chairs is by having certain designated leads. We are nine members of the council, six committees. So three of us have various leads and and that too could change. Okay. What's the one thing that um, somebody listening to this can do to help the county get to effective zero? There are a number of different organizations and programs that are providing those services, but uh, to, to, to house and shelter individuals. What members of the community can do uh, is a little tougher because for individuals who are chronically homeless and for families who are on the verge of becoming homeless, that's actually the next step in this process. After we reach effective zero for chronically homeless individuals, we are going to uh, double down on preventing homelessness among families to add that preventative medicine. And that is really just being a good neighbor, um, working with some of our nonprofit providers and and helping either support those with time, treasure, or talent, if, if you will, and making sure that in our budgetary priorities here in Montgomery County, that we resources are aimed at making sure that families can stay in their homes because ultimately that's what this is about, making sure families can stay in their homes and do not have to flee to live on the street or shelter. Okay. So uh, I think it's time to talk politics. 
Who do you like in the presidential race so far? Oh, in the presidential race. So that's a moving target every single day. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm intrigued by multiple number of candidates. I, I have not publicly, mm-hmm. you know, endorsed anybody, but I think Kamala Harris of, of California is a very intriguing candidate. I think uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, and I'll say them in the same breath, I think are both appealing uh, in, in a different way. And, you know, Michael Bloomberg just said that he's not running, not that, you know, I was intrigued by him, uh, but the, the field keeps growing. And, and quite frankly, I think that the more people who get into the race, I think is great. A robust conversation among the Democrats party is is what we need. But for me, the guiding principle is who can beat Donald Trump. And there are so many different factors involved in that. But when it was the heartland and the industrial Midwest that essentially threw the election for Donald Trump, I want to see how, which candidates can appeal to Ohio and Michigan and Minnesota and Pennsylvania. And that's, that's a, that's where I, I add a little more weight to my decision-making process. So since you bring up the Midwest, what do you think of these stories about Amy Klobuchar being such a horrible boss? Are they, will they at all be a factor in anybody's decision on who they vote for? Or is it just just nonsense that's thrown out? So having been a journalist at CNN, uh, particularly one who covered presidential politics, and I, I spent nearly a year on the campaign trail in 2008 covering John McCain and Mitt Romney and Mike Huckabee and lots of different stories there for, for totally another conversation. But yeah, there's an insider-outsider game that is currently being played. And while you know we in the D.C. region might read all of these stories, salacious details of how an individual is working with his or her staff, I don't think the general public pays attention to this. They want to see who is going to help make their lives better and who might, you know, who they want to have a beer with if, if you go down to even that level of politics. And so, you know, we could read in, in, in all of the, the online magazines and newspapers some of these salacious stories, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm not quite sure it matters. Okay. Have you ever thrown a binder at one of your staff members? I have not. <laughs> have you ever chewed them out for not bringing you a fork for when you offered you a salad. I have not. I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident in saying I've never asked anyone on my staff to get me a salad. Okay. Well, all right. So we're not going to see you in those stories, I take <laughs> it. It's not only uh, the presidential race coming up, but we're going to have an open seat in the governor's mansion. It's kind of early. I'm not sure that anybody has actually kind of put their hand up to say that they want to be considered, but obviously everybody wants to be considered. So is there anybody that you think you can see now that we should be paying attention to? Well, so let me say from the onset, I am not interested in being the governor of the state of Maryland. So everyone minus Evan Glass is interested in being governor. Hey, we're three months into my job as a Montgomery County Council member. I am focused solely on this. This is my full-time job. I am traversing our 500 square mile jurisdiction as uh, vigorous as possible. And I just want to make sure that I'm able to help the residents of Montgomery County. You know, in in two years time or so, the Democratic field will start forming for for the governor's race. And I'll, I'll have those conversations with whomever wants to talk with me, but I'm not even thinking about that. Okay. So what's your take so far on Mark Elrich? How's he doing in his first three months? So Mark Elrich, as as the new county executive, uh, we've met and, and talked frequently. And I've shared with him from day one my desire to help him modernize government, make it more efficient, make sure that our taxpaying dollars are being used to do even more good work because we have limited resources. And there are a lot of things that he wants to do that I want to do. My eight other colleagues on the county council want to do, and we just have to figure out how to make that possible. So I, I think the county executive has already shown uh, a willingness, desire, and legislation he's put forth to make the government a little more nimble. And so he he's recently asked for shifting some personnel, director level personnel, which I think will strengthen his hand in um, directing government in in a certain direction. And I'm I'm inclined to support that. We haven't had uh, the work session on it yet, so I want to learn a few more details. But you know, he's going to be releasing his budget very soon. By the time this podcast airs, it might already be out. I don't know. But we'll wait and see where that budget is and how we're, we're able to make that document, translate that document into new policy goals. Okay. And on a more personal note, uh, hopefully this is in your wheelhouse. It's certainly in mine. What do you think about the state of journalism right now? You left it, I guess, voluntarily. Um, what's right and what's wrong with it? 
Yeah, I, I left journalism after 12 years, and that was partly because I was tired of traveling. I did a lot of travel around the country, and you know, frequent flyer points can only give you so much joy, especially when you're not able to use them. And on the other end, it just became a, a, a 24-7 cycle with social media being added to the mix. I, I, my personal life was was being strained. And now clearly being being on the other side of the lens, or in this case on the microphone, some of those dynamics are back. And I do live a 24-7 life and deal with constituent needs all the time. But the difference is I'm, I find myself doing something. You know, I'm being an activist for change. But more broadly, and back to your question with journalism, there, there are elected officials serving in, in the highest offices of our land who are factual deniers. And I'm not quite sure how journalism can cut through when people want to deny facts. And I'm not sure how we get past this. It might be a temporary moment with, with the occupant of the White House and other leaders on Capitol Hill, but there is truth and there are lies. And it is journalism's job to sort through that. And I think we've reached a point in journalism where a, a, at least a few outlets will say climate change is happening and we do not need someone rebutting it. And that's progress because I remember when I was at CNN, for everyone who said climate change is real, we had to have somebody on saying, no, it's a hoax and it's it's not a problem. But we've gotten past that. And so now we just need to keep pushing through. And I believe that journalism will sort itself out. And part of that will be who who occupies the White House and who who remains leaders or is leading uh, various aspects of, of Capitol Hill. But journalism is a tough job these days, uh, but it's a really, really important job. So where do you get your news? I get my news, Montgomery Community Media, I get my news. I, I am a print subscriber to the Washington Post. I, I get it every single day. And being a news junkie, I do like having ink on my fingers. And I read it digitally as well. You know, social media, I just see so much on social media. And these days, people are tagging me when they want me to see something. And depending on when I get home at night, I might tune into Rachel Maddow, uh, get all fired up before I go to bed. Uh, and then I try and to follow some local television outlets as well that really do cover the DMV in a way that national cable will never be able to do. Okay. You made kind of a splash on your first day of work at the uh, at the county council by taking the bus to work. Have you taken the bus since? So I have taken the metro multiple times. I took the bus on my first day, which was actually two buses. And what I knew then and what, I, what has only been reinforced is we live in a really big county. And for me to do my job correctly, I can't take public transportation as often as I like. I have actually taken the metro more often than I have taken the bus in the last three months because when I'll have meetings downtown or uh, at other points on the red line, I will take the metro. But we have worked out a schedule where I will be in the office a full day, which will allow me to to take the bus. So coming here uh, off of Goody Drive doesn't accommodate me taking the bus, but we have carved out in my schedule uh, moving forward more days when I can do that. Take the bus, that is. Okay. All right. And what's your, what do you think of the bus service in Montgomery County? Is it, is it where it ought to be or how would you improve it? So I think we, we, we have fair, adequate bus service here. Uh, we do have an extensive network, but you know most people don't take the bus. And so they don't know how well it works or how poorly it works. And that is another reason why I'm dedicated to taking public transportation, metro and, and bus service as well. You know, I do serve on the Transportation and Environment Committee. And a few weeks ago, I advocated to the county executive that we allow kids to ride free on our ride-on system right now. Kids Kids are able to ride the system for free between 2 and approximately 8 o'clock at night. And students were telling me that was not enough time. They need to be able to get to school in the morning without having to pay for those who don't take MCPS buses. And then if they have a job or have to do caregiving or just want to go to rec recreational activities, the ability to ride the bus uh, will afford them those opportunities. And so uh, bus service, not only for me to go to Rockville is one thing, but I want to expand it for everybody under 18. And in that sense, we will help foster a new generation of transit users, help them become more environmentally conscious and do right for those who are reliant on transportation to begin with.
Okay. All right. Well, I think now's a good time to wrap things up. Thank you, Mr. Glass, for being here. I'm Doug Tolman, Senior Reporter for Montgomery Community Media, and this has been Montgomery Talks. Our engineer today has been Mike Valentine, and our executive producer is Gaynell Evans. Come back next time when we'll be talking Montgomery on Montgomery Talk. Thank you.